Welcome, everyone. We'll get started. It's uh, 4.15, so past 4.15. Um, welcome to the lightning talks. The format's going to be, basically, we're going to have um, some people come up um, and just give a really quick five-minute lightning talk. Um, if anybody in the audience wants to join in, um, once I'm an, done announcing um, all the five, feel free to come up and talk about a topic with yourselves or have a discussion. Um, that's the whole point of this. All right. First up, we actually have Robert, Robert who's going to be talking about YAML. So yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Beam and YAML. So we have, uh, of course, we have the Java SDK, and then we had the Python SDK, and then we had the Shio SDK. Then we got the Go SDK, and you know that wasn't enough. So now we're looking at making a Rust SDK, and then there's the YAML. Uh, and one of the great thing about YAML is YAML isn't an SDK. We can have a language without an SDK. So um, let's look a little bit about, I think an example is worth a thousand words. So what does a pipeline look like in YAML? So you just say, here's my pipeline, and here's what I want to do kind of the simplest pipeline you can imagine. Um, the great thing about this is you say, I know what that does. I don't have to like go and read a bunch of docs or anything. I'm gonna read a JSON and I'm gonna write to uh, CSV. Um, you can also add um, some transformations in here. So you can have a pi filter and that just executes this like a filter. Only the keeps the things that are, you know, column three is bigger than 100. Um, you can do multiple transforms. Uh, you can do a SQL transform and it says, apply this SQL to my collection. So I'm going to read from a CSV, I'm going to do a filter, I'm going to do some SQL, then I'm going to write it out somewhere. Um, and there's many examples here. Um, so this is actually a readme file um, that's right in the Git repository. And I can do all sorts of branches and everything like that. Um, one of the things this takes advantage of is it takes advantage of schemas, it takes advantage of cross-language transform. And um, so, and it's a work in progress. So uh, what can you do this? this? You might say, well, why, you know, if we have all these great SDKs, why do I want YAML? So um, some advantages with YAML is that um, it's simple to write and read. Um, you don't have to like learn a language or anything like that. Um, fairly self-explanatory. Um, hopefully, you won't even need to install an SDK. So kind of the first thing you say, okay, how do I how do I write Beam? And you say, well, you just write some code. But first, you have to go and like download these dependencies and set up your Maven and you know get a Java compiler and maybe you know have some Python. And one of the goals with this YAML is we should be able to submit, for instance, YAML right to Dataflow, or you can submit YAML right to a Flink cluster and have it execute without even having to install uh, the SDK and everything on your own machine. Um, so what remains to be done? Well, let's, uh, there's uh, um, several improvements that uh, we, want, we want to do, and let, there it goes. Um, and this is kind of a call for uh, help, anyone who wants to help with this. Um, it's in the repository, submit some pull requests. Um, this first one actually is uh, mostly done. I should reference the pull request that's there. But um, we want to make aggregations easier. Um, so, you know, come up with a syntax for, I want to sum over a field. Well, how do you express that in YAML? That's kind of an open question there. Um, and we have some things like uh, joins. Uh, we want to have more IOs. So pretty much any IO that is available as a cross-language IO should be able to use it from YAML. And part of this is just making all our IOs available as cross-language IO. Um, you know, and there's things like uh, documentation, fit and finish. Uh, dead letter queue, I think, is an interesting one. Um, how do you do the dead letter queue pattern? We want to make this so easy that like no one you know doesn't do a dead letter queue. Um, so any questions? So it's pretty easy to read this and see how a linear pipeline would be described. How do we? What do we have a good example for like uh, you know a more complex DAG where you've got you know multiple starts and multiple yes outputs. So here is a nonlinear pipeline. Make it smaller so it all fits. So here I'm I'm reading and I'm reading. And so if you notice, these other ones had a type chain. And this type chain means that my inputs and outputs are implicit in the order here. And uh, for anything else, what I do is I don't say type chain and I name my inputs and outputs. So for instance, for here, SQL. And I say, I have a left one and that's that guy up there. And the right, right one is this one right here. You've just named your P collections. We should maybe do that in general. Yes, that would be handy. So here, here, and actually these are technically not names. I'm naming the transform the P collection comes out of. And I don't have any examples here. If the P collection produces more than one output, then I would like say, you know, read left dot foo. And that's the foo output of the read left. Got it, cool. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, 
Hi folks, uh, my name is Steve. I'm a cloud data engineer at Google, uh, based out of Amsterdam, a long way from home. Uh, and uh, when I saw lightning talks, I figured, yeah, I, I've got some slides from 2022 uh, that are specific to some, some data flow stuff that we did, but it's, it's generic to, to Beam, so you can reuse all of this um, in any Beam pipeline that you want. Um, and this stemmed from, let me get to the, the problem first, uh, the, the complaint box that, that I have uh, from some of my customers and, you know, on a bad day, they will just say, data flow is expensive. And you're like, yeah, I can really help you with that uh, because you're not being specific enough. On a better day, they might say, data flow shuffle is expensive or streaming engine is expensive. And you're like, aha, well, now we got something. Um, so I thought about this for, for a while. Um, you know, and there's various reasons why, uh, you know, shuffle could be expensive, um, but, some of the main things that you can take away from that is like, oh, well, it's billed per gigabyte processed, um, right? So that's one of those constraints that you can work with. Um, that then is also highly dependent on the, the serialized format. Um, and efficient coders only get you so far, I guess, um, because the approach that we took to solving some of that, right, even if you're using an efficient coder was, um, well, this is the approach is that we can apply compression uh, so that would reduce your, your overall payload size, regardless of, um, you know, what, what type of data you're putting in, as long as it's somewhat compressible. So if you've got a, you know, big string field or you're taking, you know, input from a web event or stuff like that, uh, it could very well be that it's, it's fairly compressible. So that's useful for large-ish data or batch data that you might pull through a batch do event in Python, uh, which is something we'll get to. Um, and you can, you know, configure some compression algorithms for speed or size so you can do the trade-off of am I doing a, an archival pipeline where I don't really care about that um, and I just want to get the, the highest compression ratio out of it. Um, so there's two solutions that we can apply in Beam uh, today. Uh, I updated the slides. <laughs> um, well, you've got this, you know, uncompressed regular thing and we're using File.io as, uh, um, as an example here. Uh, so. The, the structures or repetition of data within your element um, will waste space in the, the shuffle that happens when you write in Falio, right? Um, so the, the one thing that you can do is apply Snappy Coder as a wrapping coder uh, around whatever coder you have. I think we had a generic record coder in, the, uh, in that instance. That's been available since Beam 2.4.0. Uh, so, but it's, you know, it's not fairly well documented at all. Um, it's used in, I think in, the source implementation and like a couple other places. Um, but I didn't know about this uh, until I started looking for it because I wanted to do this. Um, significant cost improvements, I think we found sort of anecdotal result is between 1.1x and like 8.5x uh, cost reductions on streaming engine in this case. Um, Snappy gives you decent compression ratios. It's optimized for throughput. Uh, so don't expect miracles. Um, and the, the configuration is almost no effort, as you'll, you'll see. So the only thing you have to do is do snappy coder of rows.getCoder to replace the, uh, the coder of your P collection with a, a wrapped and compressing coder, and then you know, follow on as, as per usual. Um, the other thing that I wanted to do was optimize this for one particular workload that I had with a customer where they've got tiny elements passing through, like sub half a kilobyte. Um, so 500 bytes, right? Less than 500 bytes-ish. Um, and that is not really compressible at all uh, unless you apply some newer compression algorithms, for example. So what we did is we uh, implemented a Z standard coder that's been available since Beam 244, uh, poetically, I guess. Uh, comparable or better compression ratios when you compare it to, to Snappy. Um, and that depends on how you configure it. The configuration of it is almost no effort, uh, but if you want to tune it for a particular workload, then the, the tuning is quite hard. Uh, and then you get ex excellent compression ratios out of it um, if you, you know, set it to uh, like full compression, the, the, the compression level to like the max setting, because then it approaches the same compression ratio or exceeds the compression ratio that you get out of something like gzip, for example. Um, but then you trade off throughput for compression size. Uh, simply replace, you know, same thing here, C standard coder of, rows.getCoder, and you're done. Or if you want to add your own compression dictionary, because that's one of those features that you get with Z standard, 
um, if you really know what your data looks like, and you can prime the uh, the compression dictionary uh, initially, and that will net you better results. Uh, so some of those results briefly, I guess, is uh, a quick benchmark, right? And this also just shows how you should be applying efficient coders in the first place, because if you look, you know, in the top right, uncompressed, 188 megs for just JSON, and then applying the snappy coder, you get a, you know, 37 megs out of it. Uh, with an Avro coder, you get 69 megs initially uncompressed and 23 megs out of it at the other end. Uh, and for these really, really small um, payloads that I was talking about, uh, initially we were looking at, uh, it was 365 bytes even. Um, and then with, you know, Snappy, we got that down to 330 bytes. Uh, with uh, Z standard, well, same thing, because that's just uncompressed. Uh, but the initial configuration, no no touching it in terms of configuration, brought that down to 270 bytes. Um, and then with a custom coding dictionary, we brought that down to 95 bytes, which is actually significant when you compare it to the left-hand side, 3x improvement. Uh, so the future state of this, and this is sort of a, a to-do list for myself, um, is what I would like to do is replace the implementation with a stream-based compression, uh, with the stream-based compression API of the, the Java uh, library that we use, because that would then avoid using the intermediate uh, materialization into a byte array that we currently do, uh, which has you know just a, a size limitation of, I guess, two gigs or something like that. Uh, so if you want to exceed that and go really really nilly with how large of a payload you want to push through, um, then stream-based compression would be interesting. Um, data sampling to iteratively train your custom dictionary. So what you could currently do, right, is take something, um, take a data sample, train a dictionary on it, and then in the next round of your pipeline, use that custom encoding dictionary to get additional savings out of it. Um, a pipeline visitor, which would, uh, you know, enable wrapping on pre-built pre transforms or just to, you know, select a couple of stages in which you want to apply this. Uh, and a Python implementation strictly because of the, the batch do fun uh, that we can then optimize, I guess. And that is, I think, all I have to share uh, on compressed coders. Okay, so uh, I was looking at Robert's YAML stuff uh, on the plane uh, because uh, the Wi-Fi wasn't working and I happened to have it locally and I was I had previously been mentioning, hey, like this uh, README test you have is kind of cool because you ex he, uh, and if you go look at his README MD, he goes in, extracts all the, the YAML code from there and uses that as the basis for the test suite for the YAML SDK. I was like, oh, that's cool. It also reminds me a lot of uh, something from my background as a statistician called R Markdown, uh, which is, you know, R as a community is very much into literate programming, always has been, you know, it has a built-in, like, Donald Knuth sweet, uh, weave, right? Like, that's part of the standard library. Uh, but these days, most people use R Markdown. I was like, ah, so sweet. I can make the YAML stuff way more complicated. Um, and so I did. Uh, so here it is. Uh, this is beam down, a name too good to pass up. And what it can do is it can actually produce, it doesn't rely on the SDKs at all, it uh, can produce uh, compliant YAML that can then be executed. I happen to have it in the SDK so I can directly execute, um, as we can demo right here. Uh, this will not work because I don't have the uh, SQL server running, but it should crash. And what happens when it does is, so it doesn't find the jar, is it actually goes through here, processes each of these blocks as they're annotated. So this one's annotated YAML. So it's like, oh, there's a YAML block. I'm going to put that in as YAML. Uh, but then I was like, OK, but things like Python and stuff like that, I don't want to have to wrap that in YAML brace, right? Like all the white space dependencies starts to get annoying. So I'm going to I'm going to steal a trick from dbt uh, and do stuff like this, where I can say, this is Python. And it knows, OK, I'm going to turn that into, a, in this case, a filter. Map is the default, but in this case, a filter Python block. And then uh, make that into the, the appropriate YAML block. And then also, while I'm here, I may as well you know, add some stuff for wiring up the inputs and stuff like that for when you want to have a more complicated thing. And then you know, while we're here, might as well do the same thing for SQL and definitely steal from dbt. So this is in dbt, if you want to talk about a table somewhere in your dbt project, you can just say ref and then the name of the thing, right, the named p collection, like John said, and it will go out, figure out what that table's, you know, give that table a name in your particular SQL, and then wire up the appropriate thing. 
And so that's what we did here. And uh, I also, when I was debugging, was running into problems, so I made a little thing that will render the graph that you've specified. So this is the graph that we just specified in that markdown file. Um, so we can render to Markdown, which we can then preview in Markdown, or you could render all the way out to HTML. So if you wanted to like upload stuff to GitHub and things like that, uh, where you get this native rendering, you can just do that. And uh, it also takes in parameters, so the input file location, the output file location we have right here. Uh, and then you know here's the code for each of the things, just like it would be in normal Markdown. Uh, so that one didn't work, but uh, what we could do is go back to our original file here, and I can make these no execute, uh, where that will just keep them from running. So let's take this one out, and let's take this one out. And then we'll go back over here so we can see it. We can prove that it does something. Boom. Rendering. Do, do, do. Boom. So there it goes. So it rendered a new pipeline. So there's the new pipeline. Now I'm missing the two blocks we just disabled. And in fact, produces the output that we specified as JSON down here. Uh, I can't see it. Oops, except I just deleted it instead of, uh, well, let's, we'll run it again. It didn't take very long. Uh, there we go. So instead of deleting it, how about we look at it? There we go. So if you were to go look at the original test CSV, it has three lines in it. One of them has call three of 100. We take everything bigger than 100, and off you go, and it executes. So. I don't know. I don't know what it's good for, but it seemed fun. Uh, and it uh, you know, has some nice features for writing some of the boilerplate YAML. You can also, if you want, directly produce the YAML itself. So if you wanted to take this and use this to produce yeah, some sort of intermediate YAML, right, in some sort of CI, CD situation, uh, you could do that as well. And then that is submittable you know, separately as just a direct YAML file. So. If we scroll up here, you can see the, uh, man, there's a lot of output from the, the runner. OK, this is a little ridiculous. All right, maybe we'll just turn that off. Let's turn off execute so we don't have to read all that. Note to self. There we go. So yeah, so there's the, uh, there's the YAML that it produces. Uh, there we are. Questions? There we go. Okay, hi. Uh, I literally threw this talk together uh, about 20 minutes ago, so if it's completely incomprehensible, that's why. I tried to lean into the lightning aspect of this. So, hi, my name is Nathan Mel. Uh, I am jack of all trades at Odin Technologies here in New York City. So, uh, if you are using Flex templates, you have probably run into this, uh, which is that to deploy a Flex template, uh, well, first you write your data flow job, and if you have any runtime options, you define those uh, in uh, an interface uh, that this probably looks all very familiar if you've ever written a Java data flow file. Uh, but then the trick is uh, to actually deploy a flex template, you need a flex metadata file. And what that metadata file is is an enormous JSON blob uh, that defines every possible runtime option that your job could take. Y you know, the same runtime options you just defined over there in your actual code. Uh, and uh, this file is used to validate the list of options that you pass to the flex template job when you uh, run the, or submit the job to run. Uh, and it also defines every option that is valid for your job, which all of which is to say, if no matter what code you write, uh, if that option is not defined in the metadata file, uh, then you can't pass that option to your job. And that means that you are keeping these two lists of options in sync manually, which is an incredible pain in the ass, uh, which is bad enough for a small job with like two or three options, but there are actually uh, several, I lost track, hundreds of thousands of possible uh, options interfaces that you can use in a data flow job. Uh, and if you are, for example, launching your job, uh, excuse me, in a Beam job, but uh, data flow is relevant to talk about here because if you are, for example, launching your Beam job in data flow, well, you'll probably want, probably want to inherit GCS options and Google API debug options and data flow pipeline options and uh, at least 30 or 40 others. And now you have to figure out what all the possible uh, flags are from these options interfaces and put that into your metadata JSON as well, and that is really, really annoying, and I did not like that. Uh, so what do we do about it? Well, we abused reflection. Uh, so first, uh, we created uh, 
a uh, meta options interface, and this just extends every single possible uh, option uh, that any of our jobs could use. Uh, we uh, keep all of our data flow in a mono repo, so th what this is is sort of the union set of all the options that all of our jobs could use. Uh, and then, at, uh, and then before building the flex templates, uh, we instantiate that meta. Uh, we instantiate that as an object, and we pass it to this build flex JSON. Uh, which, uh, as you can see, uses the JSON object uh, utility to uh, just start an object there, put some of the boilerplate into it, uh, and then passes the actual uh, class, the, uh, the options class, to this thing, accumulate params. Uh, and then we get sleazy, uh, so we go, we iterate all over all the declared methods uh, in that we match the method name, and if it starts with get, or is, uh, then it's probably a uh, probably a beam option that we care about. Uh, cre we create another JSON object, uh, and then we uh, strip the prefix off of it, uh, and then uh, even more fun, we start looking for all of the decorators, uh, uh, excuse me, um, annotations. I can never remember which one's J uh, Java and which one's Python. Uh, we look we look for the annotation uh, that says description uh, for that particular flag uh, because that's where the handy help text is going to be. Uh, and what we spit out is well is a metadata file. And you can see here uh, that we yeah we put the we put the description annotation into the help text. Uh, we as the label uh, we uh, append uh, which source interface the flag came from with the flag itself uh, and of course the flag itself is the method name uh, stripped of the get or is prefix and so this just tells you what we did here so uh, hopefully you weren't squinting at that code trying to take notes hopefully you're interested uh, we're going to put a blog post on the Odin Engineering blog that will have code samples. Uh, if you're, for some reason, really desperate, uh, please just email me, and I'll be happy to share the code with you uh, before I get around to writing my blog post. That's it. Right. <laughs> uh, well, Nathan said he was uh, over-prepared this 20 minutes ago. Um, I think... Well, I don't have any slides. I'm on a borrowed laptop. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll quickly talk about uh, Apache Hop. Um, we've seen lots of code on uh, presentations um, to build pipelines to deploy um, whatever runs on, on Apache Beam. Hop takes uh, a bit of a, a different, different approach. We um, provide a visual way to um, build data pipelines. Um, and for example, this is the uh, well, the Hop Web uh, UI, which is a, a visual ID that you can use to build uh, data pipelines. Um, and let me go to the samples project. We have a couple of uh, runtimes, so you can run in the native engine uh, on your local machine to develop or to. Um, um, run deploy pipelines that can run on a single machine. But for uh, Beam pipelines, uh, we have a couple of, um, um, well, we support, support the direct runner, Spark, Flink, and um, basically what you do is you define a visual uh, pipeline. So this is reads from a um, a file in uh, Google Cloud Storage does a switch case uh, statement that you can figure in, um, and here we go, brilliant, uh, that you can figure in um, just visual properties. Uh, each of these um, properties adds a, a different option, collects it again, and then writes it out to a different file. Um, and I can show this right away, but if you go to the um, metadata perspective, each of these pipeline uh, run configurations um, have their options. You can specify an engine type, uh, for example, the data flow, and there you can, uh, well, configure everything. This is, a, well, a bit of a list. We'll have to uh, clean that up a bit. Uh, but for example, here you specify the uh, uh, the fat jar location. You can build a, a fat jar from well the the option in the top that just compiles all of the um, jars and dependencies in uh, a single fat jar. 
uh, staging location, the number of workers, uh, and auto scaling, the machine type, all of that can be configured and then sent to uh, data flow where you can follow up on the progress and what that looks like. Well, this is a blog post that will be in the docs um, one of these days. Um, and well, this is the pipeline that I just showed. If you send that to um, Dataflow, well, this translates in, into uh, a pipeline back. So you have the switch, uh, the different options, the collect, and then finally write out to, um, uh, to well, uh, storage files. And at the end of the execution, you get the uh, hop GUI again. Let me open that in a new tab. Um, at the end of the execution, uh, hop GUI receives all of the, the metrics uh, from um, well from the execution. So we have uh, a link with the um, yeah with the full metrics. In a nutshell, could go on uh, for quite a while, but that's it in, in two minutes. Anyway, so um, around last week, um, Ahmed uh, from from our team suggested the idea of uh, of producing some prompts to uh, you know prompt samples to train machine learning models uh, with Beam, and so um, we figured it was a good idea. So we uh, we tried to put a little forum together. Um, and so what this is is just is nothing more than an invitation to um, to help us gather whoa, uh, prompts uh, for Beam. Uh, I uh, I was brainstorming with ChatGPT uh, names for for this, so it's uh, it's Beam's 2023 prompt extravaganza, the ultimate prompt list. And uh, anyway, so what's this for? We want to build a knowledge base of Beam Q and A. Um, and the, the main target is to fine tune uh, LLMs, uh, and we our aim is to publish this data set in uh, the Beam website. Um, and so again, what this is is um, I'll show you a link to a form, and what I'm asking is uh, to to help us out by uh, filling up uh, question and answer uh, uh, samples uh, about Beam, if you if you would please. Um, so some quick tips that I prepared. Um, when you write a prompt, uh, you know you can write like a user. Uh, you can be uh, casual and try to um, advice that I saw is that it's um, it's good to to show some level of expertise in the prompt so that um, you can train the model to um, to adjust the level of the response to to the level that comes in the question. Um, there's Generally, there's prompts that can be question prompts, uh, which is, you know, what is X, or how do you do uh, Y, um, phrase prompts, and keyword prompts, right? Which uh, these are examples of this kind of prompt. Um, um, anyway, uh, writing a response, on the other hand, response tend to be more formal, uh, and uh, try to match the words from the prompt. Uh, and you can use basic markdown. So. Uh, in, in general, these data sets, they use basic markdown. So things like bold, italic, and code blocks will work. Uh, more complex stuff, uh, you know, it won't be very helpful. Um, and that's it. So, you know, if, uh, if you feel up for it, um, we have a QR code and a Google form. Um, you can, it's optional to add uh, your email, but we will, we will do a quick raffle of something. I still haven't figured out what. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, we'll contact you after. Um, and of course, we'll remove all of all of the personal data before we publish uh, to the website. So, um, uh, if you feel like doing this, please do. It'll be very cool. Uh, I'll go do one myself now. 